Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Benjamin, and welcome to another episode of The Happenings of the Roanoke Valley Chess Club. And today we're going to be playing a playing over a game that I played uh, the other night uh, against a friend and uh, member of the club, uh, William. And, uh, well, he had the white pieces, I had the black, and... While I am primarily a Sicilian player, um, I, I really like C5, and I specifically play the Dragon variation. I decided that in a you know in a five minute game, I wanted to have a little bit of fun, and I decided to play uh, this the the Aliakin, uh, the Aliakin opening um, or defense, and specifically the most uh, joking variation of it by playing knight g8. <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes I will do this, like, um, I'll occasionally play a Pierce, I'll occasionally play this specific variation of the Aliakine, and really it's pretty much those three openings that I'll play as black against uh, Pawn to King 4. I will occasionally play E5 and go for uh, you know, a Marshal or occasionally a Traxler or something like that just because it's fun but, you know, when I would do this, I just am really kind of in the mood to do something weird and that's kind of what happened. <laughs> Um, so right, we've broken up the center a little bit. We've got an open uh, D file now, and uh, we're going to start improving our development. And actually, technically, we wind up with a lead in development because of the weird way we've played this. Um, C3, Queen D5. Now this is actually normally you wouldn't want to bring your queen out this early uh, because you know C4 could be a threat, but that's a waste of a tempo and. I can play, say, a queen a5, and then queen b6, and black's doing all right. You know, I've got the ability to castle very quickly, add more pressure on the d4 square. Um, the knight's kind of under some level of threat. I can take it and fragment uh, the king side for white, but I don't think I, w I would do that because at the end of the day... White's going to get a lot of space on the king side, and it's going to be really difficult to prove that I've got the compensation for bishop for knight in that instance. Um, so I probably wouldn't do that. So after bishop e2, I decided, okay, we're going to castle anyway, which is fine because we're we're getting our king to safety. He castles, so that's normal. Knight h6, the point of this was to either open up a line if he, say, played bishop takes knight, or so I can play knight eight, uh, sorry, knight f5, knife f5, and maybe start sacking pieces on the king side, because I got it in my head that white's pieces are all either on the queen side, or when they come off the board, I'm going to be the one who has development, and... It's going to be easier for me to go after his king than it is for him to go after mine because without the pieces there, I've still got my queen involved. I'm going to be shoving my pawns down the board, and my pieces actually get out fairly quickly in that instance. Bishop f4, knight f5, as stated, uh, knight d2, h5, and at this point I'm basically saying, okay, I'm going to just be throwing pawns up the board, I'm going to be sacking material, stuff like that. And it looks like I just trapped my bishop, and I did, on purpose, because I'm opening up the the uh, the F, the H file uh, to get at that king, which, like I said, it doesn't look like the king is in a weak position, but you'd be surprised at how weak it looks. So the reason why I played f6 when normally I'm very against playing this move is because he can't really take it because then I take towards uh, towards the wing for once. I play e takes f6 and my bishop is coming to d6 um, and I'm going to have an open h file that I can double up on um, potentially. And if he does nothing, I can actually strike back at the center and then play e6 later. 
And it's actually going to be a little difficult for him to prove that uh, opening up the D file was a good move. So it's a little, it's not an easy position for White. So he takes material. If you're going to get attacked, you may as well be up material. And I have a bit of a reputation that is somewhat well-founded for doing this type of thing, and it's somehow working out at times. Um, last night I reviewed this with an engine, and the engine hated my play at, at very much. Um, but it, you know, whatever. Knight h2. And that's probably the right move. So, take back in the center. Uh, you know, the pawn on g4, I don't really care about it. And I don't care about my knight being pinned. Um, and actually, in this position, material is equal. <laughs> I've won my piece back. <laughs> I like it. I like that. Uh, rook took pawn. And... Uh, Okay, so this is a little bit of a difficult move to, to, to truly wrap your head around. So, that knight is um, under attack from two pieces, and it's only defended by one. But I thought about it and I realized those pieces aren't good defenders of the, black, uh, of the white king, and it's a little difficult for his pieces to get active, because if I take away one defender, uh, his king is going to wind up on h2 after, say, e6. Let's assume bishop takes, um, you know, I play e6, and all of a sudden bishop does something, maybe goes back. Bishop uh, d6 pins the rook to the king, if he were to take my rook. Um, if he plays you know, after, say, after the move I was considering, which was hilariously the only move I looked at, um, uh, if he plays rook takes knight, it's checkmate. So, this isn't the... It, this isn't as stupid as it looks. <laughs> um, this is a move that probably only I would consider. <laughs> because I don't have enough... I would theoretically not have enough development to justify this, but the mate threat is pretty significant, and you can't play rook takes knight, and if you play bishop takes knight, e6, he took with the bishop to try and give some material back, so I wound up only being down in exchange, but bishop d6, and all of my pieces are attacking, rook h8 is just the end, and uh, his knight is loose, you'll see why. In a, in a few moves, uh, his rook is his rook on h1 is not or on a1 is not doing anything. Queen is still undeveloped. All of my pieces are developed, and I've got three of them attacking. And you know, if I really need to, I can bring the knight over to that side of the board. Queen f3 was played, um, and the reason why is because he can't play queen g4. Um, and I'm assuming. William was looking to triple on the f-file. But I don't think that's an effective move because, well, at the moment you can't even play rook f8. But uh, but the reason you can't play queen g4, which would be desirable because it pins the queen to my king, is I can just take his queen because the rook is pinned to the king. Um, but okay, this move does make sense because you're trying to actually get your pieces active. Rook h8, what else? You know, the point of this move is, of course, I'm actually beginning my attack, but it has a clever, clever threat that I'm actually putting my queen on the h-file. I'm not going to be, you know, going, you know, dropping my queen down in, into the center of the board. I'm going to be going along the h-file. And the rook is kind of in a very bad way because you can't save the rook and you can't stop me from attacking your king. And you've got other material problems. Um, one line that I would have certainly considered would have been, you know, rook here. But after I take, you know, you're with my rook, you're you're not in a good way. And I can work on playing. Say, I I can do. A, there are a few things I can do. So rook there is not good. Uh, 
So my opponent gave check, William gave check. And I played King B8, which was the end of the game because, well, he didn't really see any choice. I'm about to take his rook, and the only thing to do to stop it, <laughs> to uh, protect that is to play G3, you know, to actually protect the rook. So I can't take it. I mean, I still can, but, you know, so I can't take it with my queen and liquidate everything off the board. Take uh, so that I can't just, you know, take with my queen and say, ha, I'm still attacking you. And I've effectively won a piece. Um, you know, I can take with the bishop and threaten his other, his knight, but, and say I'm still attacking. But I'm still attacking even if I take with the queen and we trade queens. Um, the reality is this is just a bad position. And... One of the major threats I can actually consider making would be to play. And he would almost be forced to take. Because if he doesn't, I play rook h1 check. And he's going to be forced to take. And I play queen h2. Um, knight f3, again, doesn't work. I can just take the rook. Um, again, it doesn't really matter how. Um... Here, you know, it, it's really difficult to suggest any sort of move. Queen goes here. I, again, I just... Actually, I would take the... I would take the rook, yeah. So, it, it just doesn't matter what happens. Queen to either of those squares, I would take the rook. Um, rook f1... I would probably play queen h2, and after king to f2, my thinking is I take his rook with my bishop. So what I'm looking at is potentially rook here, queen here, king here, here. And I'm thinking about, you know, I've got plans of playing rook to the f file and then discoveries. Um, I'm not sure what a good move for white is here. Maybe knight f3 to hit my queen. And then, yeah, queen h6. And I'm still doing very well. And, and I'm up a piece. So, yeah, it's... This is such a hard position to find a move for white that uh, William actually resigned here. And again, it's 100% understandable. Um, <laughs> a bit of a crazy game, um, but that is what I that is what I am known for. <laughs> I am known for the that type of um, <laughs> that type of move and that type of game. So anyway, I want to thank everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Take it easy. Have a nice day.